This experiment introduces you to oxidation reduction chemistry, or redox chemistry for short. And in this redox chemistry, electrons are being transferred from one compound or from one element to another. So as opposed to a covalent bond where the two atoms share the electrons and form a bond, in a redox reaction, the electrons are literally moving from one place to another. And in this chemistry, the oxidation state of the different ions and of the different elements, you can play around with that. Where some elements really only have one oxidation state other than neutral uh, element from the periodic table. Things like the alkali metals all have a either zero or plus one oxidation state. The alkali earth, alkali earth metals have either a zero or a plus two oxidation state. They're losing electrons to create those ions. The transition metals, however, and some of the other uh, elements in the main block exist in multiple different oxidation states. And it's through this redox chemistry where you can figure out what the oxidation states are and you can test concentrations or amounts of how much uh, of one compound or of one oxidation state there is. So through a redox titration like this experiment, you're looking at changing the oxidation states of these different uh, elements as some elements will gain electrons and become a negative ion or will lower in charge and others will lose electrons and become either positive ions or uh, go up in the overall charge. And in this experiment you're looking at a number of different titrations, a few different reactions where you're looking at the redox chemistry and figuring out concentrations based on the stoichiometric ratios of a balanced redox reaction. This experiment focuses on a broad range of chemistry that's called oxidation reduction, or in short, redox chemistry. And this covers a lot of different chemical reactions. Redox chemistry is specifically the transfer of electrons from one compound to another. When you go and have a chemical reaction, there are different types. Sometimes the electrons are shared in between uh, the two atoms forming a bond. And in other times, the electrons are fully transferred from one compound to another. And this is the case with redox chemistry, where in one side there are electrons that are leaving, and in the other side there are electrons that are showing up or, or joining into that compound. And you've seen these types of experiments or these types of reactions before, either in Chem 1 or 2 or various other things. Uh, you just may not have realized it. So one of the most simple redox uh, chemical reactions that there would be is the dissolving in metal in an acid. And in this case, this example, there's the solid magnesium reacting with two H plus acid ions, and that generates the magnesium two plus ion and hydrogen gas. In this case, the magnesium loses electrons and the hydrogen is gaining electrons. So the electrons transferred from one reagent to the other and they swapped positions. And what that does is it changes the oxidation state of the different elements. Now, the oxidation states you've looked at before when uh, elements are going from their 
elemental form to their ionic form or changing the charge on an ion, those charges are the oxidation state. Now, all of the elements on the periodic table are at their ground state. They have the number of electrons that are that is based solely on the periodic table. All of their valence electrons are there. But when these elements turn into ions, they're either gaining or losing electrons. They're undergoing a redox chemical reaction. And you've covered these types of things in Chem 1 before, looking at uh, charges on ions and calculating formal charge of elements and things like that. But uh, some of the basics are an alkali metal ion will always have an oxidation state of one or zero. Uh, the alkaline earth metal will have uh, zero for its element or two plus for its ion. The small, halogen, uh, the small halogen ions, the halides, in particular fluoride and chloride, would have an oxidation state of minus one. It gained one electron. Oxygen typically gains two electrons for a two minus oxidation state. Nitrogen typically gains three electrons for a three minus um, oxidation state. And the transition metals is where redox chemistry really can cause some interesting effects because the transition metals can have multiple different oxidation states. In this example of vanadium, vanadium is a transition metal, but it can exist in multiple different oxidation states. The vanadium can either lose two electrons, three electrons, four electrons, or even five electrons. And depending on how many electrons that particular uh, atom or element has lost, the color is different. The vanadium two plus compounds are typically a purple color. Vanadium three plus compounds are typically a green color. Vanadium four plus compounds are typically a blue color and vanadium five plus compounds are typically a yellow color. The, by changing the oxidation states, by uh, it undergoing redox chemistry, it's changing uh, the molecular orbital diagrams, it's interacting with that D subshell and causing different color changes. Now, you've, you've done this type of uh, calculation before to, trying to figure out what the oxidation state of an element is in a compound like this. So in this compound here, this ion, vanadium dioxide ion, there are two oxygens. Each oxygen has a charge of two minus. So overall, that would give a two minus, or I'm sorry, a four minus charge. There are four extra electrons. Vanadium needs to balance that out with an overall charge of minus one. So that means that in this VO2 minus, the vanadium is in an oxidation state of plus three. So these oxidation states play a very important role in redox chemistry because they're changing. The atom itself isn't turning into something else or hooking into other components, but it's changing its oxidation state. The number of electrons is changing. So in redox chemistry, there are a number of different terms. There's the process of electrons leaving an atom is oxidation. So if an atom goes from uh, in this case, magnesium, it's going from a zero charge to a two plus charge. It lost electrons. So it, this process, magnesium going from magnesium metal to magnesium two plus is oxidation. The compound that 
causes oxidation, so that's the other reactant, is called the oxidizing agent. The process of electrons joining an atom or gaining is reduction. So in this case, the hydrogen H plus gained electrons to become hydrogen gas. And the compound that causes this reduction is called a reducing agent. So in this case, uh, the magnesium. When the reaction occurs, the oxidizing agent, this H plus, becomes reduced. And the reducing agent becomes oxidized. Now, looking at these terms, they're relatively confusing, going back and forth with oxidation, reduction, oxidizing agent, reducing agent, and these sorts of things. And there are a couple of different ways to remember these types of terms. One of them would be oil rig. Oxidation is losing. In the process of oxidation, you are losing electrons. Reduction is gaining. In the process of reduction, you are gaining electrons. One thing I've always looked at is the charge. In something that is being reduced, the overall charge is going down. It's going from, in this case, the hydrogen is a plus charge and it's going to a zero charge. This, the charge was reduced and the other one is oxidation. And going through and looking at these and comparing the strengths and weaknesses of oxidizing agents and reducing agents is part of looking at this redox chemistry. A reducing agent is something that wants to get rid of their elect uh, get rid of their electrons. So Reducing agents are the things that cause reduction. So if they cause reduction, they have to undergo oxidation. Typically, metals are reducing agents. They want to lose their electrons and form a positive charged cation. And these are very, uh, these things are Reducing agents are something with low electronegativity values because they don't hold on to their electrons very well. They hold on to them relatively loosely. So something with a low electronegativity value would be a very good reducing agent and a very bad oxidizing agent. And there is a trend in reducing agent strength that is correlated with the electronegativity. So the best reducing agents are in the lower left corner of the periodic table. So as you move from top to bottom on the periodic table, reducing agent strength is increasing. And as you move from left to right on the peri periodic table, reducing agent strength is decreasing. So in looking at just the alkali metals, Cesium would be a better reducing agent than rubidium, which is better than potassium, which is better than sodium, which is better than lithium. Once the process or once the uh, reaction happens, these metals would then be turned into their metal ions. And after that, they're now oxidizing agents. And what makes a very good reducing agent like cesium, it wanted to get rid of its electrons. So it was very good at that. It lost its electrons and it, because it has a low electronegativity value. But once it does that, cesium ion, CS plus, in theory has the capability of gaining that electron back but it is very difficult to do so. It is a very poor oxidizing agent because of that low electronegativity value. So when a very good 
oxidizing agent reacts, it becomes a very poor reducing agent. And this same trend is um, also seen in oxidizing agents. So an oxidizing agent wants to gain an electron. And typically, nonmetals are better oxidizing agents because they have these higher electronegativity values. They want to gain the electrons and hold on to them. And that same trend as the reducing agent are as reducing agents can be seen with the oxidizing agents except in reverse. So for an oxidizing agent, something with a high electronegativity is a good oxidizing agent. So that means elements in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table are very, very good oxidizing agents. In particular, the halogens. So fluorine, the, in its elemental form, its molecular form, F2, is a very good oxidizing agent, followed by chlorine, then bromine, and then iodine. And when the oxidizing agent reacts, it gains its electrons and then becomes the ion, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. And once it's in its uh, ionic form, it's technically a reducing agent. It has one extra electron, but and in theory has the capability of losing that and going back, but it's very, very difficult. It has a very high electronegativity. It was great at gaining that electron, but now that it's there, it does not want to get rid of it. If something is a very good oxidizing agent, then when it reacts, it will be a very poor reducing agent. So these are the terminologies that are uh, you'll be playing around with in uh, redox chemistry, trying to figure out what process is happening. Is it oxidation or is it reduction? What is the oxidizing agent in a particular reaction? Now, because uh, redox chemistry is the combination of an oxidation reaction and a reduction reaction, both of them have to occur at the same time. You cannot have just an oxidation reaction occurring. There has to be a reduction reaction also occurring to balance it out. Going back to our initial example of a metal dissolving an acid, the magnesium metal is gaining electrons. So the uh, oxidation, or I'm sorry, is losing electrons. So the oxidation reaction is the magnesium losing its electrons. So it went to the magnesium ion and two electrons. These two electrons split off from the magnesium metal. The reduction reaction is happening to the hydrogen, H+. And two of these H plus ions gain electrons to become one molecule of hydrogen gas. So two of these electron or two of these hydrogen ions gain two electrons and it becomes hydrogen gas. These two processes balance each other out. In this oxidation reaction, it generates two electrons. And in the reduction half reaction, it uses those two electrons. So if you add these two together, there's two electrons on both sides and it cancels out. So you're left with magnesium metal reacting with two H plus ions, electron cancels, to give magnesium two plus ion, hydrogen gas, 
and those two electrons cancel. So when you're looking at a redox reaction, you're looking at both of these processes occurring at the same time. And a lot of times they're written out as half of that reaction, this, where they'll write them as the two processes separate. So you can see exactly how many electrons is this oxidation process generating, or how many electrons is this reduction process utilizing. So that way you can mix and match and figure out if you have something that generates uh, one electron, but the reduction reaction uses two, that means you'd meet, need twice as many of the oxidation reactions to uh, balance out the reduction. And in redox chemistry, this is all about balancing the oxidation and the reduction. The electrons in both sides, in both processes, have to be the same in order for the overall equation to be uh, balanced. Redox reactions, like all chemical reactions, always need to be balanced. There needs to be the same uh, number of atoms on the reactant side as the product side. But in a redox reaction, not only do you have to balance the number of elements on each side, making sure that all of the uh, manganese ions or manganese atoms are both present on the reactants and the products, but and all of the individual atoms. But you also have to pay attention to the overall charge and the electrons. Because in a redox reaction, the electrons are transferring from one place to another, in the middle of the reaction, they're loose. They're going from one thing to another, and so you need to pay attention to those and look at them. Many times a redox reaction, you can just look to see uh, how many electrons are moving back and forth. You're looking at the half reactions. In the oxidation half reaction, you're looking at how many electrons are being generated. In the reduction half reaction, you're looking at how many electrons are being used up. And by balancing these, those half reactions, making sure that uh, the same number of electrons are being generated as are being used up, you can balance most uh, redox reactions. However, under certain conditions, there are a lot of different ways that elements and ions can interact with different uh, compounds, particularly in uh, oxygen, with oxygen. So you'll see that in the lab, you're working with permanganate ion. And permanganate ion is a purple uh, colored compound. The solution would be purple. And it's MnO4 minus. There are four oxygens, one manganese, and overall that ion has a negative one charge. Looking at that, the specific oxidation state of the manganese is seven plus. And in the reaction, you're taking it all the way down to manganese two plus. It's gaining five electrons. So those five electrons have to come from the oxidation half reaction that can be balanced. But what about all of those oxygens? You're starting with a compound that's containing oxygens, so they need to be accounted for. And you need to figure out how they uh, play around and where they're actually going. And that's when you're dealing with balancing redox uh, reactions in either acidic or basic conditions. And there, for balancing them in acidic and basic conditions, you're looking at the oxygens and hydrogens and how those play a role in the overall balancing of the redox reaction, where those electrons are going and how, it, uh, how they balance each other out. So in both cases, either balancing by uh, a redox reaction in acid 
or in base, there's sequential steps that you can follow to more easily figure that out. And when you're balancing in base, it's a little more difficult. There's one more step, but the easiest way is to balance it in acid first, or at least start balancing it in acid, and then continue on just by adding one additional step. In many simple cases, just by looking at the two half reactions and figuring out how many electrons are being uh, generated in oxidation and how many electrons are being utilized in reduction, uh, you can balance uh, the equations that way. And that works for a lot of simple cases, but a lot of times in oxidation and reduction reactions, there are the molecules involved are a little bit more complicated. So in the case of this, uh, one of the reactions in this experiment, it's the reaction of Fe2 plus and the permanganate ion, MnO4 minus. And in this reaction, the Fe2 plus is oxidized to Fe3 plus. It loses one electron. But also in this reaction, the permanganate ion, initially the manganese has a seven plus oxidation state. And this is reduced down to manganese two plus. And you can see just by this that if uh, the iron Fe2 plus generates one electron and the manganese needs five, that you'll need five of these reactions. But what happens to all of these oxygens? Chemical reactions need to be balanced. You need to figure out where all of the different components are going. And when you get into redox chemistry and balancing these uh, oxidation and reduction reactions, not only do you have to look at where do all of the atoms go and account for all of the atoms, but now you have to account for where are all of the electrons and are the electrons and the charges balanced on both sides of the equation. And this is, can be done in two sets of conditions you can balance a redox reaction under acidic conditions or under basic conditions. And the basic uh, conditions have one additional step, but overall it's a stepwise process to balance these reactions under these different conditions. So the first step would be look at the overall reaction and split it apart into its individual half reactions. And then first balance all of the atoms except for oxygens and hydrogens. So in this case, the uh, oxidation of iron two plus going to iron three plus, it's balanced. There's one iron going to one iron. On the reduction half reaction, there's one manganese and there's still one manganese in the product. So this is all set. Then in these half re or in these redox reactions, they're occurring in solution. These are all ions and ions themselves cannot exist by themselves. They need to be uh, bound with something else and not a chunk of ion. It's dissolved in something. So in pretty much all of the, uh, the examples and all of them, at least in gen uh, general chemistry, they will be dissolved in water. So you can always pull in some water from the solution itself. It's there, it's in the beaker. So it can participate in the reaction if it's needed. So 
The second step in balancing a redox reaction is that for every oxygen, you'll add water molecules to balance that oxygen. In the case of the oxidation, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, there's no oxygen, it's balanced. There's zero oxygens on both sides. But in the reduction reaction, there are four oxygens in the permanganate, so there needs to be four oxygens in the product side. And you can balance that by adding four water molecules. The next step is balance the hydrogen by adding acid. And this is under acidic conditions. There are acid ions, there are H plus in the solution. It specifically says that this is an acidic solution. So you can add acid to balance the H plus. So by adding four waters, there are now a total of eight hydrogens on the product side. And that means you would need to add eight hydrogens on the reactant side to balance. This oxidation, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, still the same. Once all of the atoms are balanced, then you can look at uh, balancing the electrons. So you see that initially, Fe2 plus is going to Fe3 plus, so it lost one electron. It separated from the iron. In the reduction side of the reaction, to go from permanganate with the manganese at the seven plus oxidation state down to the two plus oxidation state, it gains five electrons. And for these two to balance out, the electrons have to be equal. If the reduction reaction utilizes five electrons, they need to come from somewhere. And they're coming from the oxidation half reaction. And each one of them only generates one. So that means you'll need five of them. You'll need five whole oxidation reactions to balance out one of this reduction reaction. Once you have that, you can add them all together. So looking at all of the reactants, it's the five Fe2 plus and the eight acid ions, one permanganate and five electrons. That those are all the reactants. The product side is five Fe3 plus ions, five electrons, one manganese two plus ion, and four water molecules. These are all on the product side of the arrow. Now that you're adding, uh, you've put them all in one line, you can see that there are five electrons on both the reactant side and the product side, and those cancel out. You need to make sure that when you're balancing a redox reaction, the electrons all cancel out. You can't have a free floating electron somewhere. And um, it, they need to be bound onto an atom somewhere. So when you finalize the balanced redox reaction, the electrons themselves needs, need to cancel each other out. So in the end, under acidic conditions, you're left with five Fe2 plus and eight acid ions will react with one permanganate to generate five Fe3 plus, one manganese two plus, and four waters uh, are generated in that reaction. So it's a sequence, it's a stepwise procedure for balancing these more advanced uh, oxidation reduction reactions, in particular when you're changing the number of oxygens. Now, under basic conditions, there is one more additional step. So 
you're starting the same way. You're starting with separating them out into the separate oxidation and reduction reaction. You're balancing everything except oxygen and hydrogen. You're adding water to balance out every oxygen. And you'll add acid to balance out every hydrogen. And after that, this is under basic conditions. So you need to cancel out that hydrogen. So the fourth step in basic conditions would be to add hydroxide, OH minus, the base, to both sides of the equation to cancel out the acid that was added in in the previous step. So in this case, if I add eight, uh, there are eight H plus ions. So I need to add eight hydroxide ions on both sides so that it's balanced. And these eight hydroxides react with eight uh, H plus ions to form eight water molecules. There is already some water on the other side. There was four of them on the product side. So now these can cancel out, or at least four of the waters can cancel out. So you're left with four water molecules plus the permanganate ion giving the Mn2 plus ion and eight hydroxides. After that, so that's the one additional step, this, this right here. When you're adding OH minus under basic conditions to cancel out uh, the addition of the acid. After that, it's the same thing. We're going through and then adding the electrons uh, to figure out how many electrons are either generated or gained in the two different uh, half reactions balancing the electrons between the reactions, so it's still going to be five, and adding them all together. Except under basic conditions, this reaction would uh, happen where the Fe2 plus reacts with four water molecules, the permanganate to generate five Fe3 plus, the Mn2 plus ion, and eight hydroxides. So it's still that stepwise procedure for balancing these uh, redox reactions, but there is that one additional step. So when you're looking through and you're balancing redox reactions, you're going through and balancing all of the different elements and the different atoms and making sure that the electrons themselves, the charge on both sides of the equation is balanced. In this experiment, you're looking at video titrations of three different redox reactions. You're going to be looking at the combinations of permanganate ion and iron 2 plus ion, <clears throat> dichromate ion and tin 2 plus ion, as well as iodine and the thiosulfate ion. In these redox titrations, there's two components, and they each have a concentration and a volume. So there are four total numbers or values that you'd be working with through calculations. In the unknown file uh, that you're going to choose, you're given two out of those four. And then using the video, you're going to be measuring the third value and calculating for a final concentration. So when you go through and uh, do a redox titration, there for, uh, the titrations themselves are used to determine a precise concentration of either the oxidizing agent or reducing agent based on known moles and known concentration of the other. So a titration involves slowly reacting one with the other through addition from a burette until all of the initial reactant is used up. 
in the in each one of these examples in this virtual titration, along with a number of others, uh, there's not really any reason for an indicator in this type of titration. You're looking at changing the oxidation state from one state to another. And many times these involve the use of uh, transition metals. And transition metals, as mentioned earlier, generate a lot of different colors in, uh, in chemistry based on the splitting of the d orbital that interacts with the visible region of light. And that's why transition metals are usually very colorful in the types of compounds that they generate. And the oxidation state or the oxidation number of those uh, transition metals will give different colors. And you can use that to your advantage as an indicator. In the case of the permanganate, so the permanganate reacting with iron 2 plus, permanganate ion is typically a deep purple color. And when it reacts and goes to the Mn2 plus, it's a near colorless color. Uh, especially at those concentrations. There's a slight pink rose color, but you won't even see that until high concentrations. At these concentrations, permanganate is a deep purple and then goes to a near colorless solution. Dichromate, the chromium ion, is an orange colored solution. And after it reacts with tin 2 plus, it becomes, again, a clear and colorless solution. Iodine is not a transition metal, but iodine has a color associated with it. Iodine in water is kind of like a brown, almost a uh, light orange color if it's fairly dilute. And when that reacts, it forms the I minus iodate uh, ion, which is colorless. So in each one of these reactions, you're starting with a color and going, at finishing the titration until all the color is gone. And what that means is that each one of these molecules, either the permanganate, the dichromate, or the iodine, are completely gone and used up. When that reacts, it forms the I minus ion, the iodide ion. So in these reactions, you're going through and adding something from the burette and you're continuing on until you see a permanent color change. And at that point, you're stopping the titration and determining how much volume was added from the burette to reach that end point in uh, the flask of the titration. In the titrations itself, the videos are set up in such a way where you have on one side the flask uh, containing the uh, ion solution, and on the other side is the volume of the burette. As you play the video, you'll see that the flask uh, solution is spinning. It's going through as the solution from the burette is being added. When you're going through and watching this, you will see that at one point, the color <clears throat> of the flask will change. And at this point will be the end point of the titration. At the end point itself, you can pause the video and read what is the volume reading on the burette at the end point of the titration.
in the report, you're going through and titrating three different combinations of redox reactions. And in all of them, you're given the full balanced redox reaction uh, and then also ask for one of the half reactions. So in the, this case of the permanganate ion reacting with iron two plus, you're asked to balance the half reaction of the permanganate ion going to the MN2 plus ion. In each one of these reactions, you're given two, uh, two of the values from the unknown file. You're given those. And then through the titration, through watching the video, you're determining what the volume from the burette is going to be at the end point of the titration. And then finally, using those three values, you're going to calculate the molarity of, in this case, the Fe2+. So when you're going through, you want to make sure that you're starting, uh, starting out. All of the titrations start at a volume reading of zero in the burette. And you're going to the exact endpoint where the titration just changes color. And you'll want to watch out for over titration. That is uh, especially seen in this first permanganate iron 2 plus reaction, where instead of a light faint pink color, it continues on until a much deeper, more of a magenta color. So we're going through and testing this out in this titration. And for each one of these, you're given three titrations. You're going to be determining the molarity, the calculated molarity in each one of those three titrations and then taking an average. You will take three titrations and the average for each of the combinations. So there are a total of nine titrations that you're going to look at. Uh, three of each combination. On the unknown file, there is the uh, provided values for two of the components for each of these, as well as a link to your individual titration videos. An actual titration of an iron two compound with potassium permanganate would look something like this with a slightly light green color of iron two solution, combined with a small amount of acidified water, the permanganate solution can then be added to the flask. Instantly, the intense purple color of the potassium permanganate disappears as it instantly reacts with the iron 2 ion, forming iron 3 ion and manganese 2 plus ion. Over time, the purple color tends to stay for a longer period before disappearing completely. The titration itself would be finished when the purple color or light pink color remains through the entire solution. As the pink color stays for a longer and longer period of time, the rate at which you're adding from the burette can be uh, slowed down. The titration is complete when the faintest hint of a pink color remains and stays 
throughout the entire solution. At this point, the titration is complete as the solution is staying a complete pink color. Burettes can be read to two decimal places. The final burette reading can be seen as 29.61 milliliters. The titration is complete when it reaches a faint pink color, a small color change. However, the addition of more and more permanganate will cause the color to be more intense. The darker the color, the more over titrated the solution is and will cause an error in the final calculated results. The second titration that you're performing is the dichromate and tin 2 plus uh, concentrate or er, titration. So again, just like the first, you are given the full balanced equation. And in addition to that, you'll be asked to balance the half reaction of dichromate going to the chromium three plus ion. So in the simulation, you'll see it go, or in the video, you'll see it changing from initially kind of a slightly cloudy opaque solution into an orange solution at the final, uh, when the titration is complete. You're going to be provided in your unknown, the volume of this tin two plus solution, as well as the molarity of the dichromate solution in the burette. Through the video, you're going to measure the volume of the dichromate solution, and then using those three, determine the uh, molarity of the tin two plus solution that was found in the flask. There are three titrations of this combination. And at the end, you'll be asked to find what is the average concentration of this tin two plus uh, solution in the flask. The second titration in the simulation is with potassium dichromate and tin two ion. In the lab, the tin two solution is clear and colorless, while the potassium dichromate solution is a vibrant orange color. As with the first titration, I can add some additional acidified water, not to interfere with the reaction, but so that you can see the color change more clearly. Upon initially adding potassium dichromate, the solution becomes a slight green or bluish green color. This is from the final product. The final product of the redox reaction is chromium-3 ion, which has a green color. In this titration, the end point would be when all of the green color is gone and what remains is the orange color of the unreacted potassium dichromate. The last titration or the last combination that you're looking at is iodine and thiosulfate. And this particular example, the colored component to the iodine is not in the burette, but it's in the flask itself. And you're knowing going in all of the things about this flask. You're given the volume of the iodine solution in the flask as well as its molarity. And what you're determining from the uh, video is the volume of thiosulfate that's coming from the burette. And you can then use these values to determine the calculated thiosulfate uh, concentration. So keep in mind, you're now given both uh, 
values of the flask itself and you're using the titration to determine the concentration of what's in the burette. Titrations can be used in both ways. So long as you have three of the values, either uh, the volume and molarity of what's in the flask, the volume of and molarity of what's in the burette, as long as you have three of those values, you can calculate um, the fourth. So in this reaction, you're given the, the balanced chemical equation. You'll you're be, uh, be asked to show the half reaction of S2O3 two minus, that's thiosulfate going to S4O6 two minus. Don't overthink this one. One thing to watch out in these videos and in this particular titration is that you're going from a colored solution of iodine to a completely colorless solution. It will be very easy to over titrate the solution because if you continue to add this colorless thiosulfate to the colorless flask, there will be no additional changes and you won't be able to tell anything after that. So when you're going through watching these uh, titration videos, make sure you're looking at what is the volume at the exact point where it changes to colorless, when there is no more color present in that flask. And that's the volume that you would be recording as the volume of the thiosulfate solution. The last titration in the simulation is the reaction of iodine with thiosulfate ion. Iodine, like, you, like what you would find in the pharmacy, is a brown solution. This reaction also takes place under more neutral conditions. And I can add a small amount of neutral water. The sodium thiosulfate is a clear and colorless solution. In this reaction, the titration is complete when all of the iodine color fades away and disappears, where there is no more color even present in the solution. At this point, the reaction would be complete as all of the iodine has converted into the I minus iodide ion. In looking at these three uh, redox titrations, um, you're kind of going through and doing the same types of calculations for each one of them. You're going to be uh, performing three titrations of each of the different reactions. So a total of nine titrations. And in each case, in each one of those nine titrations, you're following the same three steps. So in each case, you're given the molarity and the volume of one of the solutions. You're given both of the numbers. And from the molarity equation with the molarity and the volume, you can use that to figure out how many moles of that reactant do you have to start with. Afterwards, you're then going to be using the stoichiometry. You're going to utilize that balanced chemical equation to figure out if you have, you know, so many moles of the permanganate, how many moles of iron would be needed to react with that. If you have so many moles of dichromate, how many moles of tin would be needed to react with that? You're using the balanced chemical equation and the stoichiometry of that equation to uh, convert moles of one substance into moles uh, of the other substance on paper. The last step is then once you have the calculated moles of the other solution, you're then using the molarity calculation again to determine uh, the final, uh, the in, that initial concentration. So with moles, 
you'll then use the volume and determine the actual molarity. So as an example, 35 milliliters of an Fe2 plus solution is titrated with a 0 0.01994 molar potassium permanganate solution. The titration is complete when a total of 27.25 milliliters are dispensed. What is the molarity of the iron 2 plus? So in this example, you're given a concentration of the permanganate solution, a volume of the permanganate solution, and a volume of the iron solution. So for the, or for the iron solution, you only have volume. For the permanganate solution, you have both the molarity and the volume. And from that, you can calculate how many moles of permanganate you have. In this uh, example, there is 0 0.0005434 moles of permanganate. Then you can look at the balanced chemical equation. For every one mole of permanganate, it needs five moles of iron. It needs five times as much iron to undergo this reaction as it does the permanganate. So by multiplying that by the stoichiometric factor, five moles of iron to one mole of permanganate, you can figure out that uh, this many moles of permanganate will react with this many moles of iron, 0 0.002717. So now you have the moles of iron and you can put that back into the original uh, molarity equation for iron. You have, this is how many moles of iron were in that flask and the total flask volume was 35 milliliters. So by dividing that out, that initial concentration of iron, that the molarity of the Fe2 plus was 0 0.07762 molar. And in this uh, simulation, in this experiment, you're going through and performing this calculation a few different times under a few for a few different reactions. So you're undergoing the same process, but you're changing the uh, stoichiometric factor and looking at different compounds to determine the identity of the unknown uh, concentration or to, to determine the unknown concentration for these three different redox uh, chemical reactions. And by understanding these redox chemical reactions, you'll be able to better understand the next segment of the course when we look at, as we're moving these electrons from one thing to another, how does that generate a, an electrical chemical potential? So after looking at redox chemistry itself, you can then go on to see electricity and electrochemical reactions. Overall, this experiment and this simulation looks at a number of different oxidation reduction reactions. You're reducing the manganese present in the permanganate ion by reacting it with iron 2 plus. The green iron 2 plus would then oxidize into the yellow iron 3 plus. The second reaction you're looking at potassium dichromate and the chromium ion in the potassium dichromate solution is in its 6 plus state and you're reducing that down to the chromium 3 plus ion. You're reducing that by um, gaining electrons from the tin 2 plus ion. 
it's going from 10 2 to 10 4. It's losing two electrons and uh, the chromium is gaining three. But again, all of these things always need to be balanced. The last reaction, you're looking at the redox reaction between iodine and thiosulfate. So the iodine, the same thing that you can buy at the pharmacy uh, as a disinfectant, is the brown solution. And that's being reduced to I minus, iodide. And the thiosulfate is being oxidized. So you're going through all three of these reactions and looking to see what is the overall reaction between these, uh, these different compounds and what conditions they're in in the simulation. Looking at balancing the half reactions of permanganate, dichromate, and thiosulfate and figuring out what is the concentration of those unknowns. In the simulation, there's a place where you can check that. So as you're performing the simulation, as you're going through the experiment, you can do the calculations and check in the software itself if the calculation is correct or not. So that way you can make sure that you're recording the correct value and know that you're understanding it before you even submit it in the overall lab report. So as you're going through, you hopefully will get a better understanding of balancing these redox reactions as well as reinforcing the concepts of molarity and solutions.